Welcome to Cutting Edge Web Content Development, the podcast where we delve into the world of CMS systems and their crucial role in website and web content development. In each episode, we'll explore the reasons why founders, CEOs, CTOs, and CMOs of web content development companies need CMS systems to thrive in the digital landscape. Get ready to uncover the secrets behind successful website management, content creation, and seamless user experiences. Here's your host, Jonathan Ames. Welcome to Cutting Edge Web Content Development, a podcast by Butter CMS. Here we share insights on the intersection of content and web development and how you can align those two often competing forces to create efficiency and drive great business results. I'm your host, Jonathan Ames, guiding you on a journey through the tips, process improvements, and technologies to help marketers and developers harmonize their strengths in the cutting edge digital experiences. Joining me today is Brian Gerstner. He's a president of White Label IQ and has a stellar background in the agency industry with over 20 years of experience. Brian's journey encompasses not only leading teams and forming partnerships at White Label IQ, but also co-founding Lariat Marketing Hub and serving as chief operating officer at Hubner Marketing. Did I pronounce all that correctly, Brian? Pretty close, Hubner, but very close, <laughs> very close. <laughs> all right, excellent. Well, all right, let me just ask you a, a quick question. Tell me a little bit about your background because you have you know, this uh, design background, but you also work with developers a lot. So yeah, um, give us a, a quick overview of you. Well, um, I started in design. Actually, I started in uh, fine arts, but then kind of moved into communication arts because uh, I really had a lot of excitement around that idea of taking other people's ideas and really being able to kind of come up with really unique and different ways to communicate it. Because it's not, you know, you can't just say something and expect everybody to understand it. There's a lot of ways to deliver um, things, whether it be visually or through content. And it just really got me excited. There's a lot of brainstorming. There's a lot of creativity there. But as I was working in the, the creative field, I went and I got a degree in IT, knowing that digital was, you know, it was the future. So in there, kind of really was able to kind of marry a lot of that, you know, content, visual asset development and conceptual into development. And as my career progressed, I just kind of became the bridge between the two. And, and that was a great place because I got to work with a lot of teams. Uh, I got to switch hats a lot, which was, uh, you know, for me, very entertaining. But then kind of even moving further into that, um, I now lead a development team of about 80 people. Um, and in that, we work with a lot of clients and agencies, just kind of really taking the ideas, coming up and kind of consulting with different ways to kind of um, solve the problem. I mean, there's a lot of ways to kind of bring data and content forward and really start personalizing experiences. And that's one place we're really at that highly interactive juncture and really kind of more personalization that people expect now. You really are a unicorn. I mean, there are not very many people like you who are able to bridge those two areas. I mean, honestly, uh, it's sometimes it feels like you need Google Translate to communicate between the developers and the creatives because they're just speaking two different languages. So how did you find, I mean, when you're working with your team, do you find it difficult sometimes to make that communication gap or is it just easy because you can see both of those? Well, I mean, now it, I don't even really notice. Um, but in, in some ways it's not because you're really, it's still creative problem solving, you know? And in that creative problem solving, you know, um, you are talking to a lot of audiences, but you really just have to identify that core issue, you know? And if you bring the people to the table and you talk through it and kind of lay it out, I mean, everybody kind of contributes and people can get in. And sometimes, you know, the ideas really take off and they morph a little bit and they always grow. I mean, anytime you bring, you know, the right people to the table, um, you, you're going to get a bit better of an idea because you're going to have to be able to test and defend your ideas. Okay. So all right, when you're bringing these two people to the table, literally, do you bring them to a table or do you do a Zoom conference? Do you just communicate via, you know, third-party well, asynchronous I channels? Think, you know, we, we capture like a lot of the high level data, but it's always better when we can hop on a call and we can talk through it. Just to verbally start processing, to be able to ask questions. Um, it, it's always going to be a better result and there's always going to be a better understanding of what's happening. Um, you know, because, you know, nonverbal communication is, is good, but it doesn't tell the entire story. You know, it doesn't allow you to kind of, you know, add on, doesn't allow you to ask questions as easily. So I think it's important to bring people together. Okay. Walk us through one of these meetings, um, because this really could help others in a situation where they're trying to create this harmony between their code and their content. Yeah. Walk us through one of these meetings. 
let's say it's the very first meeting you're getting the creative staff, you know, to meet together with your developers Mm -hmm. and you're trying to hash out what this project's going to be like. Are there certain things you always do in those meetings or things that make it work better? So, um, um, a little hard for me to say because I come from a design background, but the, the key thing is content has to lead. It's all about the story. I mean, if it, it has to, I mean, we're not, it's not a thing. It's not a website. You're selling an experience, you know, you're, I mean, people don't make purchases rationally. People are not rational beings. We're emotional. Okay. And it's through the stories that you can really start to connect. And, you know, be it website, be it video, be it the content itself or the high interaction, you're just telling that story. So, I mean, if at the very beginning, the key thing is that story's got to be clear. You got to be able to tell it. People have to understand it. They have to know what the brand is, what the experience is about. And once you get that, you know, then people can contribute easily and you can really kind of iterate and riff off of that. But, um, that, that's the one thing I would say, like, and as I said, I'm a designer, so it took me a while to learn this, but like content has to lead. It's all about the story. Mm -hmm. Great, great piece there. Now, do you ever have problems with those who are building out the content in the code, getting that story? Does it take any kind of work or do they usually just pick up on it really quickly? Um, usually they pick up quickly. So, you know, the, it is, it's a process. So, and and you got to trust the process. So with the story, even before you get to the code, um, you've got to work with design. Okay. And design has to really kind of create that experience, you know, but design may not know what they can do. They don't know their limits. And sometimes you're going to exceed your limits. You know, Hey, I've got this cool idea. And like, yeah, that's about a million dollars. But so it's, it's, it's really important to bring key players to the table early on, you know, let people, you know, test ideas. Um, and then, but trust the process, you know, content leads with the story, bring it to design, let your designers go, let them, let them have a lot of ideas, but bring developers in, you know, get the check, get the ideas, plan it, you know, and, um, then move forward into development. Once you get into development, then it's important to go back and check and make sure that the experience that's coming forward really is coming to life the way it was expected. Mm -hmm. Are there certain processes that, uh, you know, the developers need to own once that, you know, story is led and understood? Um, in it, a lot is just really understanding exactly what it needs to be done. By the time it gets to development, it needs to be clear. The developers need to be able to contribute to say, what can be done? How can we do it? You know, what's the effort and impact that's going to have. But by the time it gets to the development team, depending on how large it is, it, it should be fairly well understood. You know, it should be clear of what, what's trying to be accomplished. Um, and a lot of that is once again, you know, content and design being able to take to the development team, like, and be able to describe what it is that they're doing, because if, if you hand it off half baked, you're not going to get what you wanted, you know, and de- the development team is there to really make it come to life. You know, that's where the things, you know, things in the browser start moving. You start to see the animations, the movement, um, you start to be able to kind of interact and even get like that personalized data to come back to you. I mean, it's even as simple as to think about like an e-commerce site, you know, as I go in, you know, what is my user journey? You know, what, what am I, what am I, what, who is the person when they're coming in? What are they doing? And then if you can then validate that all the way through to development, you can pull it off, you know, but almost anything's possible with enough time and budget. But, um, so when we talk about making those ideas and making the content come to life, that is key time and budget and your developers are going to have a really, a lot of input at that point. Yeah. I think some of the issues that teams run into, besides what you've laid out clearly here, Mm -hmm. you know, having people at the table in the beginning, story leading, and then, uh, you know, bringing in your code people early on so they can contribute, is that you're kind of uh, saddled with particular processes or technologies uh, that may kind of inhibit that free creativity uh, that's necessary to have this kind of uh, connection you're talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, uh, you know, in situations where I've been in, it's, you know, there's this existing way of doing things and, uh, you know, here's what you've got to work with Yeah. or it, you know, here's, here's what we've got in our tech stack. You got to build it within these constraints. And a lot of times, you know, that really limits both sides. So as far as, uh, you know, when you come up, I'm sure you've come up against this in a project where there's been some kind of limitations there and you've had to work with those. How do you flesh those out, kind of give people the option so they can either decide to change it or, or stay where they're at. 
Uh, first of all, um, you know, I like to make the same, but like, you know, true creativity comes from limitations. You know, if, if there's no limitations, it's just kind of free form, but it's great too. Don't get me wrong, but like limitations are what really forces you to be creative. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if those limitations really are there, okay, then I would just say you got to up your game a little bit. You've got to really kind of like try to approach this in a more creative way. And maybe it's not even, maybe it's just keeping it simple, you know? Um, but I truly feel like the limitations shouldn't be able to really limit you too much. Um, I mean, I'm saying that in like a generalized way, but there, there's a lot of ways to tell the story. That's why as a creative, you're there, you're there to be able to, and maybe this, if you're limited by technology and the technology stack or the budget, just tell a shorter story, tell something with more impact, tell it, you know, um, less is more maybe, you know, you don't have to go into a grandiose chapter level experience. Um, two, a lot, a lot of your consumers in the digital areas and the webs, the webs, but uh, I mean, the, they don't have, you don't have a lot of time anyways. So if you keep it simple, you're probably going to have more impact. Simple is hard, by the way. Simple is really hard. Simple is really hard, actually. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, operations side. I mean, I know one of the things that impressed me about your background was how much you've worked in operations here. And obviously, the fact that you've worked on both sides, you know, the code mm -hmm. and the content, very impressive. Talk to us about ways that you've found that help you increase the efficiency of the process uh, of working together between these two sides and getting things done, not just initial creation of a project, but even ongoing efforts. Hmm. I'm saying a lot of people may not like this, but deadlines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It needs a deadline. If, okay. And, and it's amazing how quickly you'll come to an, uh, an agreement if you have deadlines. So, um, it's not always going to be a great idea, but you can move forward with it. Okay. And you can validate and you can go back to the table, you know, but like, um, I would say as far as building efficiency is get a deadline in there, iterate quickly at the very beginning, you know, don't sit there and try to come up with a final product. Just do a lot of fast iteration at the very beginning, you know, and then step your way forward and you can always come back. Okay. Um, but, um, I, I think that's really important for efficiency because if you don't iterate, you're not getting those quick, fast failures. And, um, then when you go forward, you might have an idea that's a little too complex or too into it, but you get married to it because it might be your only idea because you spent like days or weeks putting, getting it all formulated. Okay. And you get this kind of, I don't know the right word, but this kind of ivory tower complex where you can't, you know, you can't really see beyond yourself. Yeah. No, that's a real danger. I think that's the, the biggest pro to me of getting everyone together in the beginning mm -hmm. is that feeling that you're not yet married to ideas. You're still at the very beginning level. Right. So you can brainstorm together. And if an idea does come out, it doesn't have to be your idea or my idea. It can be the group side from that particular I mean, day. And not, it's not in content, but like I said, it came to visual arts. I, I had one teacher who would, I'd be drawing and he'd walk up and he'd just start just tearing your paper away, just taking it away from you, just forcing you to like restart it. You know, he was forcing you to like, believe like, um, a cliche, but you know, it's about the process. You really got to love the process, you know, and you got to trust the process. Um, don't get too married to the, the result. Um, and that way you can, you, you can move forward. You can work with the teams. Um, and then even going into development, you still have to pivot a little bit. Once you get there, you are going to have limitations and you're going to have to come up with maybe a couple ways to make it happen. It could be a deadline limitation. That's one of the most common ones in budget, as I said. But even then, like you run into just actual functional limitations where it, it briefed well, but it's executing poorly. And so you're going to have to pivot a little bit later. Yeah. I think one of the things I've really learned to love from the development mindset is the idea of sprints. And that kind of ties into the iterative and the deadline yeah. uh, comment that you just made, you know, creating in these organized processes that have dates, everyone works together, kind of moves it forward. The ball goes down the field. It may not be the touchdown yet, but you feel yeah. like you're making progress. So, and that, that whole idea of like sprints and agile management, um, is, is unique. Cause when you think of, when you're, you're doing a sprint, if you're following agile, it, it's not like you do your job and you're done. Like you're part of a team. You've got a, a, a goal to accomplish by the end of the week. If you get your part done, you help someone else. You're married to the sprint. You're not married to the task you were given. You're married to the sprint. So you got to step in and there's a lot of innovation comes from that because it forces a lot of cross collaboration between teams. Yeah. Now you are kind of in an interesting situation because in your agency, you serve other agencies and you work mm -hmm. on projects where 
you've got to come in and be a part of whatever their process is. Yeah. How, how does your team create organization when you're working with several different companies with different processes? Um, it's not too hard because like by the time it comes to us, um, a lot of what we're seeking is clarity. So, and then we're really good at we, what we do. So we're bringing our processes in at that point. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of that idea of specialization. Like, you know what you do. You're really good at what you do. You do what you do really well. Okay. And then you're going to hand that off, but there's a little bit of overlap because you're both accountable to the outcome. So even though you, what you do well, you work and you consult and you talk. And as far as like the different processes, a lot of it is how it's handed off, you know, how, how well planned, how well developed, how clear is it being communicated? How well has it been kind of gathered to be able to hand develop? And then it comes in different ways, you know, like, I mean, I've had, I had things brought to us on PowerPoint presentations, you know, or uh, Microsoft paint, you know, and then you get like the really well thought out, you know, like here's the design here. It's all set up. The layers are proper. I've got a brief. I'm going to walk you through where we're doing, why we're doing it. And I'm going to ask you for ideas early on before the delivery, because I've brought you in to the beginning a little bit. Um, so when we work with agencies, one of the things that we do is we really support um, the process early on, like while we're winning the work and while we're scoping the work. Uh, we work with agencies to really kind of put together that scope of work to talk through the brief for us to be able to understand it, you know, and be able to really kind of set expectations very early. So that's the key, like bring everybody together at the very beginning, then you can move forward. Each different team can work with each other and force. I would say the key thing is force your teams to overlap. If you don't have cross department communication, you'll never have innovation. Oh, that's a great one too. You're giving me all these great sound bites today, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a, maybe a, an experience that your agency has gone through. Think of a client that you've worked with where you had a really good outcome on the end and uh, the processes that you used kind of from the beginning to the end to ensure that, you know, tying together, the coming together of your, your two parts there. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of map that out for us? Um, so in some of the more complex builds where we're doing like SaaS application or kind of web, web application tools, um, really for those highly personalized, um, the key is, you know, it, iteration. So we're, we're not, we're following the process a little closer to the T. So there is the ability a lot of times to skip a step and sometimes that's fine for efficiency. That works just depending, you know, maybe, maybe the, the experience is only going to live for a couple months. It doesn't have to, you know, be brain science, but like, um, it's going through it, like getting the rough outlines, you know, going into wireframes, you know, going into design, bringing the client back in, you know, being able to pitch it against multiple people. It is, it's said, it's just carrying collaboration across the board, but some key things in making that process is have a couple key people, like almost like, not, not like a growth team, but like somebody from content, somebody from um, design and development to be like key stakeholders in the development of it. So they're watching the project go all the way forward. They're bringing the right people in at the right time. Um, that's, that's really good because when you create that like high level team, especially if it's a larger, more complex project, uh, then you have people who own it, right? So if you're just pushing a project and you're not creating ownership, then you know, no one owns it. You know, <laughs> if no one owns, if, you know, if everyone owns it, no one owns it. Um, so it is, it then ties exactly back into some of those same things. Um, the most successful things are planned well at the beginning. Um, so as you, to your question, where you talk about the process, ones that have gone really well, where we've been able to tell the story, create something very interactive, or even create a really dynamic experience with like the content or the user experience. Um, it is that key thing, you know, Put the time into planning in the front. It will pay off. Okay. So many times you know, you hear like, oh, I don't have time to do that. Let's just skip. Let's just skip forward. I'm, I'm telling you, it, it, you save time. <laughs> you absolutely save time getting the planning done in the front. Have you ever had a, a client situation where you had competing objectives from different people, different departments that you had to try to align? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what are ways that you found useful to do that? Um, I, I practice what I call radical candor. <laughs> uh, um, it's just, you, you just need to call the elephant out in the room. You need to point at it while everybody's there, tell them it's a problem. You know, you can't, I mean, it, if, if you just kind of skirt it and fix it, sometimes it's kind of faster. And I guess hopefully you're working with people who can accept that well, you know, 
Um, if you're not, there's just a lot of other problems that are not, you know, they're going to affect the project, going to affect where you are. Um, you, you know, you have to listen, you have to be able to talk. And if you're not in a place where you can, you know, come to the table and talk about, hey, there's a problem here, there's a conflict, we need some clarity, here's some ideas on how to get there, then, you know, I mean, and it's not it's not the project that's failing. <laughs> yeah. Common problem is, and especially the bigger the organization, the more people that often have a stake in it. They may not be the owners, but they have a stake. And so they have a, maybe a separate objective. And they mm -hmm. may not easily or initially come to the table and be there in the room when you want to call that elephant out. Mm -hmm. So it's how you address things like that becomes important because, like I said, it is important to say it. <laughs> it's just drawing those people into that process. No, and I know it can be risky at times, depending upon the size and the dynamics and the politics of an organization. But um, um, you just, you kind of need a champion. You need someone who's like going to lead it. And even if there's conflicting things, they're going to say, hey, I, I'm going to make this decision. Okay. Because, you know, clarity is kindness for everybody. And um, I think that the problem that you described, um, what ends up happening is you just kind of get something watered down a little, a lot, you know? Because there's too many competing objectives and um, there's no one there to make any kind of bold decision. And you just kind of get a watered down product at the end. So, you know, the, the outcome is a, a product of, you know, what goes in. So uh, as far as strategies, if I may, well, there is like, you know, I, I just want to reiterate, it's sort of, you, you have to have a champion in there. Okay. Someone who's willing to take some sort of risk to make something bold, to kind of, you know, to own it, to carry it through. Even if there's competing factions, that I just I think that's just the key thing. Like, and someone's got to like I don't know, rage against the machine. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, Brian, uh, maybe talk to us about you know a project that you really that you've done that you're proud of mm -hmm. that you feel like illustrates some of this uh, story led you know developer involved uh, projects mm -hmm. uh, that could maybe inspire uh, some of our listeners. So, um. I can talk about it. I apologize, though. I'm under non-disclosure with pretty much all my clients, so I can't. <laughs> That's not under non-disclosure. Like, they won't get you killed. Yeah. So um, there's um, what, one particular. So we went in and we started doing a lot of just high-level assessments with the, um, the executive teams and the owners of what they wanted to do. And um, it was a manufacturer um, who represented a lot of broad industries who weren't necessarily directly related. Um, and as we talked, we realized the... Um, we had to tell, tell a lot of disparate stories to different people who were different reasons, you know, and the experience on the site um, had to really kind of funnel people quickly. So when you get there, you have to kind of self-identify quickly and get from there. The site itself was really a lot of just personalized configurations, getting to almost kind of microsites within the sites to be able to tell the story about um, how you experience that product. Um, so when we went into it, um, we spent probably about two layers in, in it about where we started planning out, building different tools and kind of the, how we were going to tell the stories and essentially kind of walk forward. It was like about a 60 page book, uh, how, how we were going, expecting the outcome to go, like what, what we were expecting out of user testing towards the end. Um, so as, then as we went in development, we just kind of spread out and the different teams started working independently. You know, the IT teams started working together to get um, all the ERP information, product information, personalized information, how we'd make those data connections with the developers. And then on the front end, we started with content. <laughs> we started telling the story for each one of those individual verticals and user stories there. Okay. And once we had that, we iterate and create multiple concepts for the very beginning of that user journey, how people enter that experience. And just kind of through those multiple iterations, kind of played them against each person, kind of got a lot of feedback. And then it was great because um, it was still privately owned. So at the end of the day, we just went to the owner and was like, hey, here's what we recommend. And I think that's the key thing. You just can't show up with a bunch of ideas. You And, you know, we presented it, you know, that kind of confidence. And because we had done the research, because we had been there and we had shown up, um, it was just, it was a, you got it, let's go type moment. Uh, from there, then it was with multiple teams to really get everything working. And it required like almost daily meetings to be able to really get all the information and feedback we needed and then to create the acceptance criteria out on the other side. Um, because even once you get it done, you know, depending on how complex it is, you've got to come back. Now, this is a, a kind of a complex web application tool that I'm talking about. Now, when you get into experience, 
like we're really trying to do something kind of unique and fun and you know think like um you know the burger king chicken guy where you typed in information and he did something on there you know like that, that that's a little bit different there's still a lot of planning but it doesn't acquire the you know, the, the technical this is much more experience oriented there you know and from there you talked about bold and someone being a champion that's that's a great example you know they've been very bold in their marketing and they've been able to make an impact you know they're remembered for certain certain campaigns and certain changes now that was a subservient chicken campaign from burger king yeah that was uh, that was really groundbreaking especially for the time i think that came in the early 2000s or the late 90s and uh, nobody had really seen anything like that but yeah that <laughs> it's okay i'm within that range but yeah, it's uh, there. You're talking about you know building for this user experience, so that you've got personas and you're trying to create something that creates that experience across these different personas. What about for the employee experience? So the EX, the people who are actually creating this content, you know, using this application and pushing that out. Have you had any experiences with building for good employee experience, so that uh, you know the modules you create are efficient, usable for them? Don't expect it to be perfect out the gate. So the key to one anywhere, hopefully, is that you're coming back, you're talking, you know, the whole idea of sprints is about continuous improvement. So you you marry yourself to a continuous improvement plan and on perfect. So you get it out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay. Particularly when you have internal people who can continuously give you feedback or in a live environment that way with employees. So I think it's for internal user experience for clients, for internal people, for internal tools is you know, perfection's your enemy, get it out there, get it working, but marry yourself to a continuous improvement program and then keep iterating forward and listening and surveying, go back to them, ask them how they use it, how they're using it, how the clients are using new improvements. And that's where the sprint cycles, as you talked about, come into play, because that's what that's all about. That's about iterating quickly, you know? Um, and so for uh, internal tools and experiences like that, I really think that methodology is important because it, it's the listening component is key part to that. Let me ask you, this is kind of a little off topic, but if you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you just started your career, what advice would you give yourself outside of, you know, stock options and where to buy and such? I was going to say golf course management. It's a lot simpler, I think. I've never been a golf course manager, of course, so I could be wrong about that. But like, um, you've got, I mean, you got to, getting into like a lot of this type of work, I feel you have to have a bit of moxie. You got to be like the process. You've got to like the, you know, change. I mean, you're, you're here to change things constantly to come up with new ideas. So going back, I don't know if I'd tell myself something different, but like, because I've gotten so far into it, I don't know anything different. <laughs> um, but you know, um, be hungry, stay hungry, hungry, stay hungry. Don't get too complacent. You know, um, you really got to, enjoy that energy that comes from um change from creativity from getting shut down you've got to you've got to i mean i don't <laughs> I, I joke i'm joke but i'm like at this point i don't have feelings <laughs> so um you've got to be able to take criticism really well and use it as a way because you know there, there's folks where criticism and they're like all right i got my next challenge here we go or and there's people who take criticism and they they back down from it but you've got to be someone who can like, someone could just be all on you about, they don't like it, they don't whatever. And you just got to be able to, you know, someone just pick yourself back up and know what you're doing and not be too worried about that, you know? Um, and I, I think that's where that moxie comes into play. You've just got to be able to like, want it, be hungry, you know? And you, you don't know, I mean, it, it you got to get used to it. You got to understand it. It's a roller coaster. But like I said, at this point, I don't know. So. Um, and every day is not like that. I'm not saying every day is like that, but you've got, um, it, it's got to kind of feed you a bit. All right. Another unrelated question, but is there any one piece of your tech stack or software that you use that's just indispensable that you just love it? I just, I'm just constantly messaging people, talking to them. It's just the quickest way to get things going. And it keeps communication flowing quickly without it bottlenecking too fast. Uh, but it would be my communication tools are the ones I can't live without that allow us to like, yeah, allow us to like, talk allow us to like you know like create awareness to shift or to come up with ideas or to share or to celebrate um those are yeah i mean i'd say email but it's definitely a love-hate relationship there uh it's because it's you know my inbox is right 
<laughs> so, uh, uh, communication, because like in this, I mean, we're in the communications business. That's that's what we're doing. We're communicating, and communication's hard. You know, like I lived all this time, and communication is even challenge. It's even more challenging. It feels, but um, but yeah, uh, those things that just allow you to quickly interact with two. I think they're also important. Two, it's well, we got some keyboards, some desks, and things, but it's the people. You've got you got people. You've got a team and you got a bond. That's what you have talent relationships and that's business. So, well, tell me about white label AQ, IQ. Just give me a, a brief idea of uh, what kind of companies do you do business with? You know, what's the main value you provide? Where can people find you on the web? Yeah. So, um, white label IQ.com. Okay. It's our website. Also, uh, LinkedIn, we produce a lot of content. So, do come to LinkedIn. We're always trying to help. And, that's the key thing. We're just here to help. I'm here to demonstrate what we do and what we do well and how we've niched down marketing agencies so that they can serve clients better. They can focus, they can add value where, where what they do well, and we can dovetail, come in and help support them and do what we do well. So there's best in class service. A million things at once, you can never do any of them well. So um, we're here primarily to work with marketing agencies to allow them to focus and just really want us to do the same through the partnerships. Um, so as I said, come to our site, it's white label agency. We're made for agencies and we, um, really are here to help and we're here to help create value. Thank you so much, Brian. Really appreciated Good. talking to you. Appreciated your insights here and I uh, loved having you on. Jonathan, thank you. Sure. Cutting edge web content development is brought to you by Butter CMS. To find out how you can build better with Butter, stop wasting dev time, and free your marketers from your legacy CMS, visit buttercms.com. Also, make sure to search for Cutting Edge Web Content Development in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Butter CMS, thank you for listening.